We have a lot of important information to cover today. Not only is it gonna help you through this course, but these can really help you out in life and making decisions when it comes to buying a home or if renting is a better idea. So please pay close attention and hopefully you will learn some stuff about selecting and financing your housing. All right, so I chose some fun pictures for this PowerPoint from some famous homes. So maybe you'll recognize them, maybe not, we'll see. Um, first, we're gonna talk about renting. So there are advantages and disadvantages to renting just like there is to buying a home. Um, the first advantage I think everybody could agree on is the mobility. It's so easy to move. So even though renting, you're not putting money towards an asset, if you are in a situation where you do not wanna be permanent for, a, for years in one place, then renting may be the best choice for you. Um, there are also fewer responsibilities. If you have ever owned a home or maybe you've watched your parents with their home, then you've surely seen that there are a lot of responsibilities, anywhere from yard work to keeping up with uh, maintenance on air conditioning units and pest control and just doing lots of cleaning. There are a lot less responsibilities with renting. A landlord, hopefully, hopefully you have a good landlord if you rent, will be taking care of most of that for you. Not the cleaning necessarily, but um, so a lot of the repairs and a lot of the landscaping and things such as that. It can also be less expensive to rent. That's not always the case, but especially with an apartment, the idea is for it to be less expensive than if you were to buy a home. Some disadvantages, there are no tax deductions on the amount that you spend on rent. We'll see a little bit later on in this chapter that there are tax deductions when you buy a home, so you do not get those deductions with renting. There's of course remodeling restrictions. You cannot go in and knock out a wall. You can't put in another bathroom. And even when it comes to decorating, you know, a lot of places are not gonna allow you to even paint or anything like that. So you, it kind of is what it is in most apartments or, or rental homes. And a lot of them have restrictions on whether or not you can have pets. So those are some advantages and disadvantages of renting. So what all costs are involved in renting? So first of all, there's a security deposit. Sometimes that will be an extra month's rent or it may just be like $250 or whatever amount. That deposit, you're hoping that at the end of your rental agreement, you will get that money back, but it's gonna have to do with whether or not there's any damage or extra cleanup at your rental property. <coughs> You also will likely have to pay for most of your utilities. So water, heat, gas, um, your air conditioner, your electricity, those things a lot of times you have to pay for. Sometimes water, maybe even electricity would be included in an apartment when you're renting it, but water itself is usually one of the cheapest of the utilities anyway. But you definitely need to remember that most of the time you're going to, have to pay for most, if not all, of your utilities. If you do still want a home phone, that's also something to consider that you'll have to pay for. And of course, your TV, which nowadays there's a lot of other options besides cable, all kinds of Disney Plus and Hulu and Netflix. So those are all expenses that you're still going to incur, even if you're renting. And what's so important is renter's insurance. Yes, you have to have insurance when you buy a home, but what a lot of people look over or don't even know about is renter's insurance. Renter's insurance protects all of your valuables inside of or own that property. So no, you don't own the house or the apartment or whatever it may be, but you have a lot of valuables in there. And if there were to be a fire or a theft or a hurricane or whatever it may be, you would get nothing for those items if they are not insured. And renter's insurance is typically very inexpensive and it's definitely worth it. I do actually know a family who lost their entire home to a fire. They did not have renter's insurance, so they started just completely from scratch. Very sad situation. I do not want that to happen to you by any means. All right, another famous home here. This is the story all about how, right? <laughs> Maybe you don't recognize that. Maybe I'm 
showing my age now, but um, step one, when it comes to home buying activities, we have five steps we're gonna cover. The first one is to determine your home ownership needs. So we need to evaluate everything that comes with buying a home versus renting, okay? So it does provide more stability. You know, hopefully you are able to stay there for years and years and you'll be able to stay indefinitely when you buy a home as long as you continue to make that mortgage, unlike a rental agreement where it may um, <clears throat> expire and you may or may not be able to continue it. Like I said earlier, there are some tax deductible um, purchases or expenses, I guess I should say, uh, whenever you buy a home. There is interest. The interest that you pay on your mortgage is tax deductible and so are the real estate taxes. We talked about in chapter three, property taxes. Well, those are, are tax deductible for a home that you own. Something you need to consider is what kind of financial situation do you have in the future? There's always gonna be some uncertainty. Will you be able to continue to make that mortgage for years and years and years, not just for the next few months, but will you continue to be able to make that mortgage payment? And also, you have to be able to keep up with all of the repairs and things like that to keep your home in good working order. A down payment is super important. This is something that people save for for years. The ideal amount to put down is 20% of the home's price. If you put that 20% down, you are going to avoid, we're gonna talk about in a minute, but some extra interest that you would have to pay. And the more you put down, the less interest you are gonna pay, the less amount of money you're paying interest on anyway. A negative about home buying is that it's not easy to change locations. While yes, it may be a seller's market and you may be able to sell your house quickly, it still takes a long time. It's still a big process and you have to make sure your home is presentable and it's a big process that takes time. Unlike renting where once your lease is up, you can just quickly move out. So you cannot just, um, you don't have that mobility that you have with renting. And like I said earlier, it's expensive to maintain. You know, if your air conditioning unit goes out, that could be thousands. If you get termites, that could cost a lot of money. You know, just keeping up your yard work, keeping up with, you know, painting, whatever it may be, all of it is very expensive. It's very expensive to maintain a house. And there's a lot of expenses right in the beginning that first time home buyers don't realize, whether it's buying a lawnmower, buying a hose for the for outside a water hose buying um extra furniture or whatever it may be there are a lot of extra expenses that most first-time home buyers don't realize are going to take place and you do have to pay real estate taxes just like you have to pay property taxes on your car you have to do the same with your home and that if you have a mortgage is going to be um, set aside with your mortgage we'll talk about that more in just a second <clears throat> you also, for step one, determining those home ownership needs, you got to think about the type of housing you want. So am I wanting something in the city? Am I wanting something in the country? Am I wanting something with four bedrooms or two or two stories or one? You really have to think about what you need and what you want. Make a list of what are um, absolutely not negotiable. I have to have this in a home. Okay, and here's some things that would be a bonus to have in a home. That's good to have a list of. Determine what you can afford. So now let's get into the really financial aspect of home buying. So you have to have money available for a down payment. So money that you're gonna put down a percentage of the home, which again, it's great to put down 20% of the home's price. You can avoid extra interest that way. Um, you need to think about your income and how much of your income is going to be taken up by your mortgage payments and buy the extra repairs and utilities and all that. And a lot of times utilities will be more expensive because your home may be larger than the apartment that you were renting. So that's something to consider. Um, living expenses. So just day-to-day -day living things that has to still come out of your income. You do not want to be house poor. What that means is you bought a home that your income is primarily going to your mortgage payment and you don't have enough to now go out and be with your friends or go shopping or whatever your normal things were 
you can no longer do because the majority of your money is going to pay for that expensive home. Um, mortgage rates are something to consider. You know, right now the mortgage rates are very low, but later they may get, they may be very high. They can range a lot depending on the economy. So that's something to consider also. Um, future property value. What is this home going to be worth when I'm ready to sell it? Is this a good purchase? Is this a good investment that may appreciate, meaning the, the value of it is going to increase? Or am I buying something that most people are not going to want? It's kind of an eccentric home that is just not ideal for most people. And I may have a really hard time selling it or at least getting my money back that I spent on it. All of that's important to consider. Your monthly payments. So remember you have to make that payment every month indefinitely until you move away. Otherwise they will take away your home. So that is very important to remember. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, step two with buying your home you have to find and evaluate a home. So the first thing you wanna do is select a location. Location, location, location. It is very important. You know, are you going to be in an area that has good schools? Well, maybe you don't have kids right now, but what if you're gonna have, you're planning to have kids in the next few years and you're still gonna be in that home? Make sure you evaluate the schools nearby. Property taxes are gonna be higher if you are closer to the city. If you live in downtown Greenville, you will pay more for property taxes than if you live out in Woodruff. And of course, anywhere in between is gonna have an in-between price. So that location aspect has a lot to do with it. How close are you to work? Do you really wanna drive 45 minutes to work every day just because you like that neighborhood? You know, whatever it may be, location is super important. All right, so when you are working on finding a home, you are most likely going to enlist the services of a real estate agent. So a real estate agent can buy or sell your home. They can take you to any place that is on the market and show you around the home when it's available. And they can help you with your paperwork. They will help you to get a lawyer, a mortgage broker. They will set up the appointments for you. They, the real estate agents do a lot. Uh, with that said, they get 3%, so the seller's agent gets 3%, and the buyer's agent gets 3%. If a real estate agent is doing both sides of it, so they're representing the seller and the buyer, they'll typically get 6%. It is possible to negotiate that price, that percentage, um, so that's something you can consider, but um, a lot of times I think you're going to find that they will not allow you to negotiate it. If you choose not to use a real estate agent, it is possible to buy or sell a home without a real estate agent, but you may have to use some extra services and have to pay several hundred dollars to get the paperwork filled out and things like that, which is something to consider. You can save a lot of money that way. Um, the home inspection. So anytime that you choose a house, and it goes into contract, meaning that you've said, yes, I want to get this house, but I'm gonna have a home inspection. It's super important to have a home inspection. This is where a, an inspector that you have researched and you make sure that they have really good reviews, it's so easy to do now, that they, they're gonna go in, they're gonna check out every aspect of the house and they're gonna tell you their findings after that. Was there termite damage? Was there a leak in the upstairs bedroom? Was there a, a switch, a light switch that didn't work? Was there an electrical issue? Whatever it may be, they're gonna send a list. And at that point, you take the list to the seller and you can say, I want you to fix all of this or I'm not gonna buy it. Or maybe I want you to discount it by X amount of dollars so that we can fix it. Or the seller may say, you have to take it as it is um, a lot of people want my home and you just have to take it as it is, but it's a, it's a negotiation aspect of the home purchase. Hopefully this is not the home that you're trying to buy in this picture here. That home inspection may be a very long list. <laughs> All right, step three in the home buying activities, price the property. So we need to determine how much we can afford, which we're going to look at in a minute, but, um, we also get to negotiate the price of the home. There can be a counter offer for that price. 
Um, a counter offer means that you've gone in, let's say the house is 200,000, you say, I'll pay you 175,000. They come back and say, mm, we'll give it to you for 190,000. And you can go back and forth all day long until one of you decides to either take it or give up. Now, if it is a seller's market, meaning that houses are flying off the market, they list them and then they get lots of offers within a few days, most likely you're gonna have to go in at at least full price and counter offering will not work out in that situation. But it's always something you can try, especially if the house has been on the market for a long time, the seller is more likely going to negotiate that price. <coughs> Once you do get under contract, you've agreed on a price, then you have to put down earnest money. That shows them that you are being serious about this offer. You are serious, you're gonna go through with it. Typically the earnest money is $1,000. As long as you do go through with it, that $1,000 is gonna go towards your closing cost or down payment. If something goes wrong, then you may be able to get that earnest money back. All right, step four, this is a really important part. We're gonna look at some, um, some homework examples for obtaining financing. So unless you've got a lot of cash, then you will have to finance the home that you're buying. First, you need to have money for a down payment. It is very unlikely and not very wise that you're gonna be able to get a loan without putting a down payment on that home. So it'd be a percentage of the loan. If you do not put down at least 20% of the purchase price, you will have to pay private mortgage insurance, PMI. So what PMI is, is an extra percentage or two. It ranges a little bit depending on the price of the home, how much your down payment is, your credit score. It depends on your risk, basically. Um, usually around an extra percent of interest that you're going to pay on your home mortgage until you have 20% down. That can really add up. That extra percentage can really be a lot. So putting 20% down is a very important step to take. And people save for years, like I said, for that down payment. And it's an important thing to have when you buy a home. And then of course you have the mortgage itself. So the mortgage is the amount of money that you have borrowed for the home. So you've paid some of it down. Let's say you paid 20% down, then you borrowed the other 80%. That is your mortgage. Okay, so we're gonna look at this example here. Actually, I'm gonna skip first and show you exhibit 1-7. It might make more sense this way. So if you look in your book on page 230, you'll see this exhibit 7-7. This helps us to find the mortgage payment factors. This chart works just like the exhibits that we looked at in the very beginning in chapter one. So we're gonna have an interest rate on our mortgage on the first column. Then we're gonna have um, different amounts of years that the loan may be for. Let's say it's a 25 year loan at 5%. We're gonna track it over at 5.0 5 and down at 25. Our mortgage factor would be 5.85. You're gonna need this for when you do your homework. I'm gonna show you an example of a homework problem right now. So if an adjustable rate, 25 year mortgage, adjustable rate means the rate is not set for the entire 25 years. It can change depending on the fluctuation in the economy. I suggest you only get a fixed rate mortgage. That means the, the rate of the interest when you go into it is how it's gonna stay the whole time. They can't go up on you later on. That's just a side note. All right, so this 25 year mortgage is a $124,000 mortgage, starts at 5.5% and increases to 6.5%. What is the increase of the monthly payment amount? So this is how we're gonna do it. So we're gonna use this mortgage factor, the mortgage payment factor chart. You're gonna take the new mortgage factor. Okay, so our new mortgage percentage is gonna be 6.5. So we're gonna go down to our chart, find 6.5, and then go over to 25 years. It tells us it's a 25 year mortgage. So our mortgage payment factor is gonna be 6.75. Then we're gonna subtract out the old mortgage factor. 
So we were paying an interest rate of 5.5 for 25 years, which was 6.14% or $6.14, sorry. So we're gonna fill that in. We're gonna find the difference between those two and then we're gonna multiply it by the mortgage amount, which was 124,000 divided by 1,000. That's telling us that we are going to pay an extra $75.64 every month in interest. That $75.64 is not going towards your principal. It is not paying down how much you owe on the home. It is simply an extra charge because you signed up for an adjustable rate mortgage. That was a mistake. If they would have signed up for a 5.5% rate that was fixed, then they would have paid $75 less each month. So I suggest you do not do that. All right, back up to this 7-6 exhibit. <clears throat> this is found on page 229. This is a long equation to help us figure out how to see how much we can pay every month for a mortgage, how much of a mortgage we can afford, and how much of a home price. And I'll show you the difference between those in a minute. So try to follow with me. I have a homework example that follows the same, um, these same steps. So we'll look at both of those. <clears throat> okay, first you have to determine what is your monthly gross income. In this situation, this guy knows that he makes 48,000 a year. Um, we're gonna divide that by 12 months to tell us that he makes 4,000 every month. Okay, with a down payment of at least 5%, lenders use 33% or 0.33, of monthly gross income as guidance to pay for our principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And they use 38% of your monthly gross income if there are also other debt payments. Okay, so we've got two situations here, example A and example B. In example B, we don't have any debt. We're looking at getting a mortgage, we get $4,000 a month, we don't have any other debt. So we use that 0.33, that 33% factor. In example A, we're gonna see in a second, we have an auto loan that we also are responsible for paying. So it tells us if we have some other kind of debt, we need to use the factor of 0.38, 38%. So we multiply that factor by the monthly income, which was $4,000, it tells us in example A, it's 1,520. Example B, it's 1,320. Now here's what we do with that. Step three, it says subtract other debt payments and an estimate of the monthly cost for property taxes and homeowners insurance. Example A, we see that auto loan for $380 needs to be subtracted. And then we're estimating that our property tax and insurance is another 300. So we're gonna subtract the 300 from each, A and B. But in A, we also need to subtract out the $380 a month we have in other debt payments. So that then tells us our affordable monthly mortgage payment, how much we can reasonably afford, is $840 in example A. Or if we didn't have any other debt in example B, we could afford $1,020 every month. Okay, so after that, we're gonna to try to figure out how much our mortgage can be for. Remember the mortgage is the part that we've actually financed, the part we've actually taken out a loan for. So we are gonna divide that amount we just calculated by the monthly mortgage payment per $1,000 based on the current mortgage rates. So we're gonna use that chart, that 7-7. Seven -seven. In this situation, it's 8% for a 30 year loan. So let's go over here, 8% at the very bottom for a 30 year loan right next to it. Our factor is 7.34. Okay, so we found the 7.34. Now we're gonna fill that in on step number four. And then you multiply that by a thousand. So you're gonna take the amount you found, the affordable monthly mortgage payment, and example A is $840, divide it by the factor, the mortgage factor we just looked at, the 7.34, then multiply it by $1,000. That tells us how much of a mortgage we can take on. 
So in example A, we can take on 114,000, example B, 138,000. All right, well remember, we are going to put down a down payment. So yes, we can finance that amount we just calculated, but it tells us we, in step number five, we're gonna put down a 10% down payment. So the other 90% is all we need to finance. So we can actually look at a little bit more of an expensive home because we have the cash to put some of it down. So you calculate that by saying, one minus the percentage that you are gonna put down. One minus 0.1, that's 10%. That tells us we can divide that number by 90% by 0.9, and it gives us how much we can afford in a home total. So the reason that bottom number is higher than the affordable mortgage amount is because we also are paying cash of 10%. So that's gonna allow us to get a bigger home because we are not financing the entire thing. Now, if we were putting down 20%, we would say one minus 0.2 for 20%. That would say that we are only financing 0.8%, 80%, or 0.8, which would be 80%. So that's how you figure out how much you qualify for and how much you can afford. Let's look at an example of this. Here we go. Okay, this will be a homework example. So our monthly gross income is 3,500. We have another debt payment every month of $260. The loan that we're gonna get is 25 years at 7%. We are going to make a down payment, good job, of 20%. And then we have a monthly estimate for our property taxes and insurance of $160. So first we're gonna figure out what is our affordable monthly mortgage payment. So this is the same process we just looked at, but here we're doing it a little more in formula format. You can do it either way, but this is a good, um, a good way to do it also. You can either use the chart or do it this way with the formulas. Okay, so we take our monthly gross income, which we know is $3,500, times 0.38. Why times 0.38? Because we have other debt. If we did not have that other debt, we would do it times 0.33. But since we do, we're going to multiply by 0.38. Then we're going to subtract out our other debt and our property uh, taxes and insurance, insurance. So we subtract out the $260 of other debt and the $160 that we're going to be paying every month for property tax and insurance. That means our affordable monthly mortgage payment is $910. Well, then we want to find our affordable mortgage amount. So there we're gonna take our affordable monthly mortgage payment that we just calculated, $910, divided by, we gotta look up that factor. So we have a 25 year loan at 7%. Let's look at the factor, 25 years at 7%, it says 7.07. .07. So we use 7.07, .07. then we multiply it by 1,000. That tells us that our affordable mortgage, the, the amount that we are actually going to finance, is $128,713. Then finally, we're gonna figure out how much can our actual home be, because we're putting 20% down, so we can get more than just the mortgage amount. We can get more than what we financed. So we're gonna take the affordable mortgage amount, the 128,713, divided by, the one minus, we're putting 20% down, so 0.2, which will give us 0.8, right? So that tells us we can look for a home that costs up to $160,891. So there's the answers there. Hopefully that helps with your homework. All right, last thing I got for you here is step five, is when you actually close the purchase, you've picked out your home, you've gone through all these steps, when it's time to actually close, first you're gonna walk through the property. You're gonna go through and make sure they took care of everything they said they were going to. They fixed the leak, they fixed the hole in the wall, whatever it may be. And if you approve of that, you're gonna to go to closing. This is where you meet with a lawyer, your mortgage broker, your um, real estate agent, and you are going to sign 8,472 pieces of paper, it seems like and um, you're gonna pay closing costs, either you or the seller, or maybe you split the closing costs. If you look at exhibit 7-9 in the book, 
It will show you a lot of what closing costs consist of. It's usually several thousand dollars. Um, you are going to have a deed, which is where they're transferring the ownership to you. And finally, we've mentioned this a little bit, but part of your mortgage payment is going towards an escrow account. This is where your actual mortgage company it has an account set aside for you to pay your property taxes and home insurance. So as long as you have a mortgage, when your property taxes and when your home insurance come due once a year, they are gonna pay that out of your escrow account. So that's pretty cool. All right, hopefully this has helped you with any home buying questions you have, but if you have more questions, please reach out. I would be more than happy to help you with those. Have a wonderful week.